So for those of us who are new, welcome, welcome, welcome. We're so happy to have you here on your faculty and uh, registrar. Um, and am I missing anybody? Um, okay. So um, the first part of the afternoon is our two session updates. And the first one is with our disabilities and accommodations with our own Matt Lister. And is Ms. Liz here? That's it. Ms. Wilcox. Ms. Oscar does um, accommodations and um, disabilities, so that's all to do to you. No, we'll see that. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. Everyone's had their lunch. I'm not going to talk about facilities. We've heard enough about that. No, no, no. no. <laughs> We're going to hear enough about facilities. Um, so today, I'm going to basically give you a little bit of a background about uh, disability services nationwide, and then talk to you about the process that our students go to have their adjustments put in place, and then field questions. One of the things you're going to hear me say numerous times uh, is consistency. Um, that's something that I strive for and hope to achieve as much as possible when we handle or when we work with our students is a level of consistency. It's probably the best thing that we can do in terms of providing reasonable adjustments for them. Uh, as a whole, this industry of disability services has a lot of inconsistency. So we protect ourselves with institutional consistency. Uh, so nationwide, there's about 11 to 12% of the population in higher ed, or excuse me, in education that is deemed to be disabled. So, and our numbers match up pretty much evenly with that. Over the last two years, we've had uh, 467 disclosures of a disability. So when I say that, this is the form that the student would fill out here at the college to let us know that they have a disability. So we do not provide adjustments or we do not put in place anything for a student without them expressing or disclosing to us that they have a disability. We can't do anything until they've done that. So by the time they get to you with this, they go through quite a few steps and a lot of processing, a lot of vetting goes on. I'm gonna go through this a little bit more later if I ask my phone book. So this process starts with the disclosure. They do the disclosure, they complete the disclosure, and then we put in, we send them a packet of information, basically, in a lot of ways, deprogramming what they've experienced in high school versus what they're gonna experience in college. Reasonable adjustments is deemed by the college. In high school, the emphasis or the responsibility that the student is successful falls on the high school, here it falls on the student, so it's a, it's a 180 which is oftentimes uh, a little bit of a, a, a surprise or a block for the student that they, you mean they're not gonna get all these things they got in high school. No, it doesn't work that way. It's deemed by the college to be what's considered reasonable. We don't alter uh, curriculum in any way. Or in high school, they would do that to ensure that the student is successful. So they go through this process um, and then, and this is important, I hope for all of you to realize that by the time you get to receive this. They have met with myself or Elizabeth in person in our offices to go over documentation. So they have to bring, they have to provide us with a letter of diagnosis from either a medical doctor, a psychiatrist, or it could be a psych ed evaluation, whatever the case may be. Um, we don't do this because Uncle Larry in uh, Florida thinks they have quirkiness. Now, this is something that we vetted. This is something that we have to make sure that the document, documentation is in place. That is consistent. We have to have that. We meet with them. We read over the documentation, and then we make a determination as to whether the adjustments are considered reasonable here at Three Rivers. We do not deviate from that. We try to make, make that process as consistent as possible as well. That consistency protects us. I was at a uh, an attorneys shipment and shipment in our Hartford, their educational attorneys. And I went to, it was two years ago, a workshop they had about disability law. And basically, they gave some case studies 
I gave a case study, two case studies that were virtually identical. One of them was in Ohio, the other one was in California. And in Ohio, they ruled for the university. In California, they ruled, ruled, ruled for the student. Absolutely no consistency. So we have to be as consistent as possible internally to protect ourselves. Basically, that they said that you're better off being consistently wrong than inconsistently right. So and it, it kind of works out that way. We have to treat everyone fairly. We have to treat everyone consistently as much as possible. So they meet with us. They meet with, with Elizabeth or myself. We then generate this document that you receive often in your classroom. It should stand red confidential. If you don't know, then I will tell you now that you have to make sure that you never disclose or talk about any, any of the disability aspects of the issues with the student ever. If they wish to tell you, that's permissible. You are not allowed or permitted to ask them anything about their disability at any time. All you have to do is make sure that these adjustments are followed. And again, back to consistency. When you get this letter, my hope, my dream, my life is a lot easier if you just follow what's in the letter as much as possible. Now I know this first one is a very common one, this additional time. This is largely in fact that uh, students with a disability, their reading pace, they have a tendency to fixate when they read, they have a tendency to regress when they read. So it just takes them longer to read. It has nothing to do with intellect. It just affects their pace of how quickly they can finish something. So we have a couple of them that identify to that. And the testing, extended time for test and quizzes, and then this one up here, additional time for in-class work, homework, and major assignments is needed. Two to three days without grade counting. This one is probably the trickiest one and the most difficult one for most faculty. I mean, I, I get conversations a lot. I've had a couple of them already this semester. Yes? Yeah, I have a question on that. This is the one my biggest part of my facing right now. When they said they need more time, do you guys have like a time frame that we can give them? Because I have one student, he always like, I give him homework. It's been three weeks, he haven't given me anything back. That's So now, what should I do? Should I be like, okay, this is a zero or not? Yeah, yes. Okay, if I put it zero or three days, about three pounds. You go beyond that, sure you like any other student. Yeah, three weeks. I, I got record three weeks. Two or three days, that's it. So what happens, or one of the biggest concerns with that is you have, in some classes we have stuff that's done weekly that has to be completed. And if it's not completed, then of course there's concern that it causes backup, and then it'll affect their ability to grasp the next level, if you will. I will say this. The best case in that scenario is to tell the student the, the ramifications of this adjustment. It's perfectly okay to do that. In most cases, as the states, as needed, most students will not utilize this every week or with every assignment. They will utilize it, though, if they have a particular disability that causes them to have little valley, valleys in their life. So they may, two or three times a year, use it, but it's, it's not meaning that they're going to use it every single time. If they are going to use it every single time, then you're fair in your responsibility to say that the impact of that is that you're going to be behind on what everyone else is doing. That's fair. But three weeks is not a Yeah, I thought, yeah, I'm, you can't like two or one because, you know, I'm just afraid of that because you was like, okay, you need more time, so I got to make sure I give that time because I got the letter. It got yeah. the confidential, but I don't think mine got the two or three days on it. He didn't specify how many days. He said he needs more time and he needs preferable seat. And that's why I make sure that the front door is always open for him. Okay, you know? so with what you just said, yeah. in the spirit of consistency, if you have something that doesn't indicate a time frame, please share that with me. Okay. I need to know. I, it wouldn't have come from me. Right. I don't know if it came from Liz, but. It's all good. It's all good. It's good. Yeah, same. It's all good. It's all good. But it should be fairly clear in that regard. Okay, the use of a laptop or a computer. For note taking in class writing is pretty straightforward. But again, consistency purposes. Let's say that Brian Kennedy says, yeah, no problem, you can do that. And Jeff Crouch says, no way, you can't do that. So now the same student is now getting an inconsistent message from our faculty about what can be utilized and what cannot be utilized. 
That is hard for us to defend. Obviously, there could be moments when a recorder should be turned off, when it's personal or when there's just, okay, please don't record this, then they should be allowed to, or they should do that. They do sign a waiver, but they're going to um, actually get kind of the recording aspect of it. <coughs> Utilizing the laptop and computer sometimes for recording purposes. So for this recording, kind of link the two together there. Sorry about that. So for the purpose of this, they do sign a waiver that they will not share the recording with anyone else, and they'll destroy it at the end of the semester. Uh, the aftermarket for Jeff Crouch's recordings is really not that good, so <laughs> there's not a lot of value there. Sorry, <laughs> that's right. It's not, yeah, the aftermarket is just not good for that. So, okay, I will say this: in defense of our students, they value these adjustments immensely, and they will protect them. So they're not trusting. Not they're not going in there thinking. Uh, I'll share this with all my buddies. No, they're, it's for them, and they recognize that. They take it very personal, and they protect it as much as you want to protect what you say in the classroom as well. Uh, since it's class notes is a difficult one for us in many ways because we do not hire note takers, but yet we have sister colleges that do. And this is, I mean, I mentioned this in the beginning, the lack of consistency in this industry is unbelievable. Uh, we have a monthly, three times a semester meeting of my colleagues that do this at the other community colleges, and we all do things differently. It's amazing. You would think that we'd have a greater level of consistency. Uh, a couple of the colleges actually pay their students 50 bucks a class to take notes. Some of them give them free tuition or a free class if they'll do it. Uh, so there are some benefits there. We rely a lot on fellow students and yourself as a professor to provide or assist with that. So it's kind of a, a vague one. All of these, all these adjustments, attendance again is up to two to three times the usual policy, or up to two times the usual policy. A lot of these, there is some flexibility within them as long as the student and you can agree to whatever that flexibility is. One thing I would always caution you with for example, extended time. The usual limit of 1.5 times the amount of time. So let's say you give your class a, a, a test and it's an hour, obviously that means they get this, the student would get an hour, an hour and a half to be completed. So you're not doing anyone a favor, including the student, if you give them two hours. Because now you've gone beyond what the adjustment states. And that, in the, in the long run, is inconsistent. Unless you do it for everyone else in that class, which is perfectly fine. So if you cannot afford a student with a disability, anything you wouldn't afford a student that is non-disabled. So you have to be aware of that. You have to be cautious of that. Um, utilizing the testing center for a separate location for testing and quizzes is perfectly fine. In most cases, the students are good with that. Um, it's, it's not always available all the time, as we know. So again, the flexibility there has to be exercised. Uh, it's pretty straightforward in regards to your responsibilities as well as the students. There's equal shared responsibility there. Your biggest goal is to make sure the test is at the testing center. So when the student shows up, they can take the test. And they'll be afforded their adjustment for that time. So you get these letters, the best thing you can do is do what the letters say be consistent with how you treat the students with the letters. Another thing, if you ever have a, an incident with a student that is, the, a lot of our students that come with a disability have been um, used to being advocates and asking for things. So this is not like foreign to them. They've had to fight this battle for a long time. So they may ask you for something, or they may look for a special privilege of some sort they were accustomed to in high school. Do not say no. Tell them that you will speak to me, then I'll speak to them. Because I don't want you in that situation where you're being viewed as someone who's denying them something that they think that they need. I can help them, I can self-direct them with regards to what we do versus what they're used to. What happens in a situation where you have a student who comes with a letter and they are allowed to have extra time and you've offered them the opportunity to take the test in the testing center with extra time and they choose not to? And then at the end of the test, they're like, I need more time. But 
I don't, I don't have time to bring you back to my office and let you finish the test now. And I don't think it's fair to let you do it, finish it, you know, in a half hour in the testing center or whatever. There just really isn't something else I can do for you at this point. Is it fair to say that to the student at that? Yeah, point? it's fair to say that. Okay. Absolutely. I just, I, I, would, I would state to them that if you don't wish to use your adjustment at the beginning of the test, you can't. I can't afford it to you at the end of the test. That's being fair and consistent. You wouldn't, you wouldn't treat any other student that way. I had a problem with the laptops and iPad use. Um, there's occasions where they're not using it for taking notes. You know, I'll walk by and they click on Facebook or the video game that they're playing. Snapchat. You know, and um, so that, that, I don't know how to deal with that. Um, I would treat them like I would any other student. Tell them to put because I don't let them. Because if there, was, if there was a student that didn't have this adjustment uh -huh. and was doing that, would you allow it? No, but I can. I don't allow laptops or iPads in class. I don't allow computers, phones, laptops, iPads, anything unless I'm told that I have to. So that right. also creates another situation because students will say, "Well, he has his open, so we need to worry about you, not him," right. kind of thing. And uh, um, but then you know, other students will say, "Well, he's he's playing," you know. Tetris. That's okay. That's good information for me. Mm -hmm. And any information like that is usable because then I can, when I meet with them, so we can call I can reinforce that with them and tell them <laughs> that this, you know, there's been some instances where I'm getting reports that students are, are using this for non-academic purposes. Mm -hmm. You will lose this adjustment. It's not reasonable for you. Again, reasonable for you to be playing a video game in your class. So yeah, it's, is that? Is that Yes. No, I'll call you if there's. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I saw a new um, item there this semester. It says additional time for test preparation. Because I remember in the past they have the, the two to three days yep. for assignments, but I saw now that it says two to three extra days for testing. Is that new or uh, was it like a? Okay, I'll answer your question globally first. Yeah. Okay, this is the most, these are probably 90% of the adjustments that we okay. produce. That, what you're referring to, Celeste, is, is not a new one. I, in the last two years, have tried to really narrow down the adjustments as much as possible while still being fair to the student. So if I see where it's clear cut that they need additional test preparation time, it's not an old adjustment. But it is a rare one that I afford. But, you know, it's 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 better enough. Okay. Because I remember in the past, like I'm talking about the online courses, but they have like right. since the start of the semester to do the test, and then you know it, the test it will close a certain day, but then you know I saw now in the past I remember that it was additional time but not additional days. Right, and I would imagine you've only seen that with one student. Yes, this semester, this right. is the first one. That's why I was surprised. Yeah, yeah I know what you're talking about. Okay, so so I need to uh, give the student the chance to for three extra, two or two, three extra days. Correct. Okay, okay. Just making sure. Do students wait too long to seek uh, accommodations? Yeah, because we get 467 disclosures over the last two years, but yep. we don't do letters for 467. So they will, and oftentimes they will be uh, parentally influenced to disclose, and they want nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. And then November 28th comes around, and it's like, oh crap, I could use those. Right. And then they come down to us, and, and I have, I have right up until the last week of the semester okay. issued letters of adjustment. Yeah, the reason I ask that is because I've taught in other places, and if, if adjustments start like halfway through the semester, they don't count for the beginning. Right, oh yeah, they, right. Just, right. They, no, so, this does not work backwards. Right, so yeah. what I do day one is tell them, yes. if you need accommodations, do it at the beginning of the semester. Correct, because you can always not use them. Correct. If you don't need them, but it's really difficult to, to go backwards. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I'm <coughs> Well, with the idea of the additional test preparation, um, if on day one, like on our syllabus, we've listed when the test is going to be covered, does that cover additional preparation? Because now on day one, you know in the next month you have a test on that day. 
So isn't that enough time or is is that not meeting the rules? Uh, logically? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, don't go there. <laughs> that, that's just logically, yes. yes. <laughs> However, I had this conversation with Jeff. Oh, Jeff left. Go ahead. Right. Good one. Oh, there you go. <laughs> this conversation with Jeff earlier this semester that it's the it's the act of a deadline that triggers the disability. <clears throat> Not how much time they had before the deadline. Okay. So if you're psychologically speaking, yeah. in most cases it's it's a psycho psychological or mental health issue. Right. The act of the debt the fact there's a deadline causes a crash. So flexibility, they're they're more likely to have a good day in three versus a good day in one. Right. So the amount of time before the deadline really has no bearing on that. Okay. Is that yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um in terms of having students that maybe some you know do make use of accommodations, others don't, uh, when you have a test coming up or something, how reasonable is it to expect the student to um, trigger or remind for that accommodation? So like a test is coming up, student has given me one of those on the first day of class and hasn't come forward and said, hey, remember to get that down in the testing center for me. Where's it at? Uh, two or three days. So let's say that they don't. Oh. So they've given the, the accommodation letter in the beginning of the semester. Yeah, right, right. right. And then uh, if I only had one, then it would probably not be much of an issue. But, right. um, but I might have a whole bunch, and some are using the accommodation, and some are not. And so so you're, you're saying like they came up to you five minutes before the test and say, yeah, I'm gonna, hey, by the way, I'm going to use this accommodation. I need to take the test. Or, or they don't. So the test comes and goes. They don't show up. For the test, oh. and they're waiting for a test in the testing center. Because it's their responsibility essentially to put it into the most um, simple terms, like to remind me to submit a test. I always tell them if they plan on using the testing center, please let your professor know two or three days ahead of time so they can have enough time to board the test in the testing center. Otherwise, it's going to jam up everything. So it's reasonable for to expect that they'll, that they'll remind us. Yes. Yeah. Now, that, now they, they, they could. They don't have to use it though, they can show up at class. Right, sure. So another Okay. So uh we get the letter for a certain semester. Will it be defective the next semester, the following, or do we do one each semester? Uh this, our students have to renew each semester. Okay. Not or they don't have to do this each semester and bring in documentation, but they have to let us know if they want to use their adjustments again, so we issue a New letter of adjustments, and it should always have the okay. all or whatever semester okay. is up. Okay, because I had a student say, No, I gave you the letter last semester. No, it's not effective. Correct. I need a new one. That's what they'll be telling them. And we've told them that probably five, five times. <laughs> <laughs> but again, the nature of what we're dealing with the population, it's not uncommon. Okay. Thank you. I got one. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to Pull me off the time. Way to go, Mike Stutz. Oh, Thanks a lot, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go. We're a really tight time schedule, so if you see Kristen and I popping up, that's because we're like the timekeepers. Thank you, buddy. Um, so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please feel free. Anybody has a question, feel free. No, to that's okay. Me. I can ask him. Exactly. Or whatever. Exactly. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Gray is our expert in all things transfer, and she will be joined by Sarah Stout, who will give us updates on uh, the TAP in a few minutes. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. I appreciate you being here. Because I know transfer is a fear of a lot of people. They think transfer and they think, oh my gosh, what do I tell the student when they're advising? So I know it's a little scary out there. Um, hopefully this can help today. Um, the good news is we have a wonderful little arts and science plan of study. They're all over there. We need them. So I'm not going to do this PowerPoint. Maybe it don't work for me. So I do hand out. Everything's over there. Um, so little arts and science is really built for transfer. So that's the good news. So look at the student who comes to you and says, I really don't know what my major is. I really have no idea what college I want to go to. I just, I have no concept of what I want to do. Of course, refer them to career services. <laughs> but also the liberal arts and science 
science plan of study is guiding you into what are the better courses to transfer out. So this is your lifeline uh, to get you started when the students have no idea what to do. So always begin with your liberal arts advising tool because that really, really helps. Um, I'm here to update you on all of our articulation agreements and things like that. Um, I'm going to let you know too, I do every year, I send out equivalency sheets for the state university. So Eastern, Southern, Central, um, UConn School of Business, UConn College of Liberal Arts and Science. I will send an email to you once they are all updated. I have them over in that box over there though. If you want me at some paper copies, I do have those versions now. This is another framework. If a student says, well, I'm thinking of Eastern, I'm thinking of Central, but I'm not positive. Again, these are freshman sophomore layer requirements. So it can really help. And again, I will email them to you probably mid-October because that's when I'll probably have the rest of the meetings and be able to get the updates from those schools. Um, so these are nice tools to be able to have. Again, I went, you know, because Matt gets really mad at me when I do a lot of paper copies. And of course, at lunchtime this morning, I saw Matt and I said, Oh, Matt, you got something on your shirt. I said, Are you? And then I went at lunch and I filled my water bottle, went and whoop, right down my shirt. Like, oh, no, um, so, the blue sheet. Hopefully, again, all my handouts are over there if you want to take them. Articulation agreements. Sarah's going to do a wonderful job of talking about TAP. I'll just do like a brief entry. But in this sheet, again, it's usually, an, this is mostly an internal document, and Deb is wonderful about putting everything on the website. So once I send you tools of, of transfer stuff, Deb will upload them on the website for us. She's fantastic, and she's just, she, the day I put it out, it's up pretty much. She's <laughs> awesome. Um, so this does give you some foundation, because it is confusing what agreements we have in place. So this will list it for you. So under here, we do have an agreement. When students earn an associate degree, they're guaranteed admission to the state universities with a 2.0 GPA. That's nice to know. That's not even an agreement that they have to put in writing. It's we have it in writing, they're guaranteed admission to the state universities. A lot of times students don't understand what a state university is. That's why it's listed here. Because a lot of them go, well, isn't that UConn? No, UConn is not part of the state university system. So that's where you get a lot of um, uncertainty on the parts of students. We have dual agreements. We still have the dual admission agreements in place, even though we do have the TAP, which is designed to transfer to the state university. The dual admission agreements are separate agreements where students sign up before they earn 15 college level credits. And that will allow them to specify, I want to go to Eastern, I want to go to Central, I want to go to Western or I want to go to Southern and they get the opportunity to meet with one of their advisors on campus. Right now I have a Southern advisor coming three times a semester, Eastern comes twice every semester. Western hasn't come because nobody's in the agreement yet and um, and Central uh, usually doesn't come up because their coursework is so clear, usually we can we do that pretty directly because again it's in the, in the focus sheet so that really helps a lot of students. So. so but again dual admission agreements are still in place. Uh, we also, again, the transfer tickets or the TAP programs. Um, I'll let Sarah talk about those. Those are designed for new students coming in that can, again, not sure what state university you want to go to and they want to transfer. Again, a nice program to say, you know, if you have a particular major in psych studies or history studies, this is the foundational levels for those state universities. So those are nice tools. Um, we also have guaranteed admission to UConn. And that's where, again, a lot of... Um, Times people have a lot of questions, what does that mean? So with UConn, again, this yellow sheet will define, because it's not for every school, it's not for the School of Nursing, it's not for the School of Engineering, even though we have a pathway, that's not part of the Guaranteed Admission Program. So in this, you're gonna see all the list of uh, the majors, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the College of Agriculture, Health and Natural Resources, and the School of Business. Slightly different GPAs in terms of transfer. Once they earn 60 credits, in a liberal arts and science plan of study, they can transfer either with a 3.0 GPA to uh, College of Arts and Science or a School of Agriculture, or with a 3.3 to the School of Business. That's an excellent, excellent program for students because what happens right now, the average is about a 3.2 GPA for the two schools. School of Business is about a 3.6 GPA right now for students getting out on their own. So again, that's a wonderful program for students who know they want to go to UConn. Mm -hmm. um, what's the recalculated mean? That's something we need to know because we don't do that with our program when we do our uh, GPAs. So. Okay. 
know, sorry, I talk fast and quick, so if you have questions, feel free to ask any time. I know we're on a time frame, too. She said to chop, chop, so I'm sorry. We don't, I thought we did recalculate. Yes. Yeah. The student retakes. No, we do not. The higher grade. The higher grade. The higher grade. Right. Right. Yeah. We don't recalculate. We recalculate then I'm not understanding what we do. No. It's the highest. If a student gets a C, right? Right. and it's the end with an A, we count the A in the overall GPA. And the C's dropped. The C is dropped. And so what is what is when they go to UConn, UConn's going to take a relook at that, and they're going to count it as a B. Okay. So they are not counting it as an A. That's going to impact the GPA going over. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, that's just business. That's important. Just the school of business. Just the school of business. And they don't always recalculate it. That's the other thing. They've been inconsistent doing that. So, but I like to warn students because I have some that have been right on that verge of a 2.3, but they've been recalculated. And they allow them to take a traditional class to build it up, too. So that's a that's the guarantee for sure. Um, and again, I'm not going to go over these in detail because I'm going out of your mind, but that's where the details are in here. Some of the updated ones, we know that Lyme Academy is going to the program restructure, we're calling it. <laughs> Thank you, Liz, for terminology. Um, so we're not sure if that agreement is still in place. But again, we usually have, you know, we have agreements with the University of New Haven. You know, Jeff has wonderful programs that transfer out these criminal justice programs. Um, so we have, you know, Post University with uh, sports management. So lots of different programs here. This will detail the grade point average requirements and the needs for students. With the UConn Guaranteed Admission, they have to apply before earning 30 credits attempted. And they're not counting high school. A lot of the other ones aren't really particular about having to apply early other than the dual admission and the UConn Guaranteed Admission program. You say they're not counting high school. Does that mean that they don't count the BC credit? Correct. So if a student does those credits, we're not going to penalize them to come here, and then they can't do the guaranteed admission program. They can't. They can still apply. That means going in 30. Exactly. It's not counting in 30. That's important for the first that they're always asking again. Can I get that student? <laughs> so yeah, so that's that's the case with that. So again, that's what this is for. So try to keep you updated on what those transfer out is. Again, your liberal arts and science is your way to go. Also uh, over there is your sheets of your transfer equivalency sites because a lot of students want to see course by course how it is going over. So your equivalency sites are updated each year. And then some transfer search engines for students to be able to look at those schools because again, a lot of them have no idea where they want to go, what they want to do. And so a lot of our foundations try to get them to start researching their very first semester and kind of looking at that. So there's no magic that I have in my office that some people think, oh my gosh, it's transfer. It's time consuming is what it is. So what I do when a student comes to me, I do pull up information. I don't know. So don't tell students I know where everything transfers, please, because I don't. What I do with them is I pull up core curriculum of other schools, I help them match it, and then I send them off to check with that. Because I'm not gonna go call every school and say, are you gonna take this course, are you gonna take this course? I see thousands of students each year. So the students will have to do some of that work. Um, and so don't hesitate to encourage them to go out and do some research. So I pull core curriculum, I go on transfer evaluation sites that I kind of look and say, hey, ask them this, ask them this, see if that will transfer. I'll help them get access to the syllabus if they need it. Um, those kinds of things. I encourage the education because they can put the syllabus in there and so they can have that if they transfer out of state, things like that. But again, it's no magic, it's just time. <laughs> so, so any other questions, concerns, because I don't want to take up time for Sarah, who's going to talk about the TAP program. Questions? So Kathleen, it's a good idea if they know exactly where they Oh, definitely, definitely, because again, we're reaching credit, our credit should go everywhere, but schools can be very, very particular. Like, I laugh all the time about, like, music history, um, you know, goes to Eastern as a historical perspective, not a fine arts. You know, so that's what we find, is each school has little nuances that we can't control for, and we do our best, you know. And that's why I have sheets for you, because I figure if we do our best to get freshman and sophomore criteria met, you're really helping out the students, so that they're, and they can overlap different schools and things like that. Thank you. What kind of questions are these? Kathleen is definitely the expert. However, do you want us to send every single person to Of course not. This no, is I just, I just want to do these little tools here. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's been a big thing. I noticed the difference in the last couple years before it was any transfer student that came in the office would always come to me. Now I'm even seeing students say, oh, I met with my faculty 
we did that work. Can you just answer this for me? And it's just like, wow, that's fantastic. So I think the tools are helpful. If there's any other way I can be helpful, please let me know. But definitely, you know, encourage students if you kind of go, ooh, you know, that's an out-of-state school. I really don't have time for that. You definitely send them to me. I'm happy to help them out. I just want to say thank you, too, because uh, I want all of you to know Kathleen goes and speaks to all of the FYE classes with this information, so they're getting it as well, which also helps them be a little bit more prepared. That so thank too. you. Yeah, except when they have their right. so <laughs> <true. laughs> I'm ready to talk, so. I was just going to share that it, you know, the rest of us in advising me have to be helpful. Exactly. We, are, we don't know the depth that you can go in, but we are able to do that. Hey, 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 hey. I'm still here, you know. Transfer and Articulation Program, that is abbreviated TAP, Transfer and Articulation Program. Um, I serve on a statewide committee um, representing Three Rivers, and then I'm also the point person here on campus. So for those of you who are new, the big takeaway message for you right now, because you're getting a lot of information to keep track of, is if you have a question about TAP, just come find me and ask me the question. Okay, so that's the big take home message right there. Um, I do have some updates, generally speaking, since we have um, a lot of people in the room. Again, new people, don't worry about it so much. Come find me if you have a question. Um, I want to let you know we do have two pathways coming down the road. So this time next year, we should have biochemistry and geography that we are offering. Um, and then I mentioned this at the end of the year, and I just want to reiterate it. I was very excited because I've been hearing um, uh, faculty who have, who have been here for a while and your concerns about the um, outcomes within the gen ed competencies. And I want to remind you that um, FERC, the Framework and Implementation Review Committee that I am on, our charge this year is to review those outcomes. So the nine general education categories, competencies um, won't change, but there are actually 84 objectives embedded in those, and those will be winnowed down. Our job is to create the process and oversee the process, and um, while well, I believe content experts do the work. So I just wanted to remind you um, of that. And then, a lot of the talk at FERC these days is about the future of TAP in the context of a consolidated college. So we just were talking about that. Um, and so I think there will be updates and this year, and but they will be in that context. So um, for those of you who are, are new, I'll, I'll fill in a little bit because I, oh no, I'm, oh, I'm a minute over, but I'm gonna take 45 seconds, oh. no? I think till, we have till 10 after. Yeah, we, it's okay, that's okay, because remember, what's the take home message? Just come find me. Talk to Sarah. Talk to Sarah. Um, and, and again, most, most of you new faculty in the room, everybody except I'm looking at you, Patrick, right? Um, your job right now is not to advise TAP students other than to say, oh, you are interested in one of these transfer and articulation programs, let me find you the faculty advisor who advises that particular pathway because we have them in the various disciplines um, and we have a lot of those faculty in the room. So not that new faculty, you'll remember any of these people, but any of the other faculty, if you <laughs> advise a TAP pathway, could you please stand up? Everybody, Mike, Susan, Ryan, Jeff, <laughs> right? So everybody who's standing up now is a faculty oh, advisor so who advises the students who want to transfer to a business program, art, sociology, a computer science, math, foreign language, English communications, criminal, uh, yeah, criminology, right? And 
so again, if you have, with one of your advisees says, I'm interested in that transfer ticket, you help them find this person. And what I, um, the one thing I, I won't give you just because of time is show you where that is on the website. It, it's on the website, but any of us should be able to help you find the TAP website and find the person that you need to get the student in touch with. You start to talk with the Oh, you, oh, perfect. Okay, so if you picked up the white piece of there you go, www.ct.edu backslash transfer, and then you click on the particular program that your advisee is interested in, and you say, oh, you want to transfer um, to Eastern as part of this math transfer ticket, you really should be talking to Brian Kennedy. Okay. Any questions? Yes, Christine. Sorry, is this the way to add more kids in a couple of categories from category one to category one that she mentions just this? So the append appendix one is the list of the general education courses, the, is the list of the three rivers courses that have been vetted for the general education um, categories, and that is a living document, and that can always be added to, and that would be the role of the faculty member who teaches that class to fill out the forms and bring them to the gen ed committee, which then brings them to curriculum with a recommendation to cadet for those who are interested. So we make the decision. We, at the moment, okay, we to make that decision. Do you have a comment, Mike? Well, I, I, I think I would just add, especially for those in student services who are maybe seeing students and have a sense of uh, demand um, and the kinds of courses that might be optimal for creativity, global awareness, and um, email the people who are in charge of those courses. Oh, great, and good. It, okay. You can CC me as well and Terry as well. Will, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, concerns? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. If you have a question about TAP, just find me. Come ask me a question. Sarah Self. Thank you very much. Yes. Hi, guys. It's the last thing I career services. Um, one thing Kim reminded me to share with you guys about the virtual career office. We are the first in the Connecticut system to have a virtual office. Um, I have one school that's reached out about how we did it and to help them reduplicate it. I haven't had the time yet, and the system office has been asking about it a lot. So I just wanted to put that out there. Okay, so this is the update portion we have just completed. The next portion is everyone is welcome. It is, it is specifically um, for our new faculty in terms of the kind of detail and the kind of things we'll be talking to. With our new faculty. We're happy for you all to stay and um, we made folders for all of our new faculty in Q13 and 14. Uh, so we were going to hand those folders out to them. We have um, some extra folders but not enough for everyone because we have no idea we have this wonderful out of the Rachel School wonderful turnout. So um, we are going to uh, have a list for those of you who would like one of the folders that we put together for the new faculty. Um, and we have a handout of the index of everything that is in those folders. We do have copies of that. So you can have a folder that with those handed out to those of you who are not our new faculty. So we also have folders for our facilitators for this section. So we're quickly going to hand those out and then we will continue on. Uh, welcome to part three, I guess. Um, okay, so as we said, this is kind of the essentials of advising uh, section. This is where we're going to try in the next uh, 45 minutes to get through as much of the basics as we possibly can. So I have, I'm going to try and cut this to three minutes. No, I don't. Okay, so um, what I'm going to talk about really quickly is I just have a few things to cover and then a no, big ones. And then we're, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of who are our students. Um, so, um, the new faculty, you have your folder. Got that. Okay. Um, the first thing I was going to say is just that um, a couple things that I like to share with faculty are, are the following. Um, they come to us with 
lots of different backgrounds, as we all know, uh, with lots of different life circumstances, with lots of different contexts. And in many, many, many cases, those are very challenging. Uh, and the thing that I, the way that I think of our students is that they come to us with a lot of grit, and they come to us with a lot of resilience. And a big part of our job is to help them take that resilience and that grit that they already have out of their own life experiences and learn how to apply that to this environment, which is very different to them and in which many of them do not have enough confidence. So that's just one thought that I would like to throw out. Um, the other one that I wanted to say is just that as today, we are doing what I like to call high structure, high relationship, which is um, giving structure in a new environment as much as we possibly can, as well as developing relationships, getting to know one another, and getting to know your context, and what we all bring to this environment, that um, that, that is what our students need. Um, and I call it high structure and high relationship. I learned that years ago in my first position at the grad school at RPI. Uh, and even though that's a highly selective school, those students needed the same thing. They needed high structure, high relationship. And as they get more acclimated, just as, as us in the new environment, they gain their confidence, and things get more easy for them, depending on their, what's going on in their lives. So um, those are just a couple of thoughts I wanted to throw out there. So um, in terms of who our students are, last year um, we, uh, we came to 50%. 50% of our students are first generation. So that's half of our student body. Um, we have uh, about 31%, 40% of our students start out, of our new students start out in developmental courses. 31% um, of those are taking developmental courses. Uh, for those of us who are new, developmental is pre-college level English and math, uh, that their placement tests and or their um, high school grades um, or SATs, we use multiple measures, that those indicate they need to take a pre-college level class um, before they're ready for the college level English or math. Um, we, so about 31% of them are in developmental and regular college classes, and 9% um, take developmental only. This is last year's numbers based on fall 17 because we just had our freeze date, so we don't have this current fall data. So we're using last year's to give us a good idea. Um, the other thing I'd like to share is that um, who are our students in other ways? So, um, I don't seem to have them right here. I'm so sorry. I'll look for them in a second. But in any event, um, of our students, 88% um, of them are in associate degrees. Um, about 4%, again, last year's numbers, last fall. Um, about 4% are in certificate programs, and about 8% are in non-degree. Um, our largest majors are general studies and liberal arts and sciences. Uh, our, our general studies is uh, 1,357. Within that general studies, we have many, many uh, pre-nursing majors. In the past, that's been in the neighborhood of about four to 500 of that number uh, come in and declare pre-nursing as their advising track in general studies. I don't, they don't all end up there, but um, a lot of people come in for obvious reasons based on career information this morning. They want to get into the medical field, many are choosing the nursing. We have 423 uh, liberal arts and science majors, and um, based on last year's fall numbers, we had 223 students who were enrolled in the TAC program, which is awesome since it's pretty new. Okay, um, in terms of the other, another aspect of who our students are, 62% uh, of their, them are continuing. Um, the new is 19%, might be a little higher this year. Transfers about 11%, readmits about 6%, and that makes up our categories of who our students are. Um, and another uh, thing I wanted to share is uh, the number of students in online. So we have 20% of our students that are in online and on-campus classes. 
classes. We have 6% who are only in online classes, and we have 74% who are taking all on campus classes. So that gives us a little bit of an idea of who our students are. Our numbers for this fall, in terms of our total number of students, is 3,997. Um, slightly less than last fall. And we have 2,316 as our fall full-time equivalent. In terms of male and female, we have 60% female and 40% uh, male. So that's a quick overview. Are there any questions? I will send you the link. Um, I, I meant to include it, but I will send you the link of the fact book that is on our intranet. It gives all of these statistics, tables, and charts. And uh, so we can all, we all have access to finding out more about our student body uh, and who they are. So that's my portion. So I am now passing, passing it on to who's next? Uh, oh, Maria, I'm sorry. Maria is out very sick today. So uh, Maria Krug is our new Title IX coordinator. And she really wanted to be here to meet you all, but she'll have to take the next opportunity. Um, I hope that your syllabi are reflecting her name so that students will be able to contact her. Um, we got an email um, from Maria Krug, and um, she's part time and she's working in Laura, Quinn's, Laura Chin's old, old office. So she sends her threats. So, tell you some mainly where to find your resources for where you're going to need to look up this information because um, it's difficult to go into detail. So what I'm going to be talking about is um, the subjects of fire drills, lockdown drills, medical or behavioral emergencies with students, and then technology help, and where you, especially where you're finding technology help after your hours. All right. So um, as far as fire drills and the lockdown drills go, the main resource to find that information is going to be on the extranet, the Three Rivers extranet. Um, on the extranet, you'll go uh, to the um, administration tab, um, and then to administrative safety, and, and then safety and security services. So fire drills, if you're in a, if anyone who's experienced here and wants to chime in, please do for anything I'm forgetting. Um, for a fire drill, if you're in a class during a fire drill, what you'll do is you'll collect your class, you'll exit to the nearest exit with your class, and what they usually ask us to do is not congregate right near the building, is to move past the first parking lot, um, usually over one of the islands to the furthest parking lot, and that's where they want the students to stay uh, until um, the fire drill is over with. And usually there are people with safety vests on who are in charge of uh, managing the, the drills and um, you could, uh, they'll help to direct you where to go as well. As far as the lockdown drills go, um, yes. Can I just make a comment? Absolutely. Uh, if you have a student that's wheelchair bound and you're on the second floor, it's important to get to the middle of the building and somebody oh. will bring the, um, carry the person down because the elevators won't be working. So just an awareness. Oh, excellent. If you have somebody in a wheelchair bound or. Thank you, Kathleen. Excellent. Thank you. And obviously, you can't use the elevator. As far as the lockdown, yes. So right new ahead. here, where's the middle of the? <laughs> 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 the same way here. Well, okay. Excellent. Thank. Thank you. Kathleen. As far as lockdown drills, these are um, drills that we practice in case we have uh, the unfortunate event of having a lockdown. Um, excuse me, an active shooter in the building. And again, you can find those on the extranet under the safety and security services. Um, so usually, um, Steve Getches will announce that we're going to have a lockdown drill in an email a day or two before we have, have one of those. Um, so they'll be announced via email. Um, if, if one is announced, you should look outside your classroom or your office and see if there are any students out there who don't know where to go. If, they, if you find students like that, call them into your office or into your classroom. Uh, you're going to... Um, 
also at that time you're going to um, pull down the shades on your windows. You're going to lock your door. Um, you, if there's a window on your classroom door or your office door, you need to try and cover that with some paper or something that will cover that window so someone can't look in. And you're going to remain quiet in that space until it's uh, until you hear the announcement that the drill is cleared. Do you have What's that? Telephone. What's that? Cell phones shut off. That's something that we all forget to do, and we don't want a cell phone going off. Yes, Sarah. And then I was going to add, and I think Steve even says in the announcement or email that the purpose of the drill is to practice the lockdown, uh -huh. but that that students are not required to. We are not required to lock down during an active shooter. Like you can also try to escape, right? That that's not. You, lockdown is not the only option if it truly is an active shooter that you know you can also flee but that mm -hmm. the purpose of the drill is to practice the lockdown okay does Great. that make sense thank you sarah um medical or behavioral emergencies with your students in your folders uh, there's a really great resource talked about um, assisting students in need so i would encourage you to take a look at that so we're not reinventing the wheel there's already a great resource here um, mainly, I would point you to, I found helpful when I was looking this up, on page one, it talks about managing students with ment mental health emergencies. So obviously, advising with a counseling center is a great resource, and if you have a problem with a student, you can walk them down there, and they can meet with a counselor at that time. Um, but if, if me immediate medical attention is needed or the, patient, the student is unmanageable, um, you can call, depending on the severity of the situation, you can call 911 yourself um, and or call camp, and I would also call campus security at extension 55555, all right? That's all located in this book. Uh, when, you, when you contact campus resources, give as much um, information as possible. You may have to fill out an incident report. And then if you go to page 16, Again, it tells you if the patient, if, excuse me, I'm a nurse. So. <laughs> the word patient keeps coming out of my mouth. <laughs> if the student or coworker or is um, aggressive for some reason and you feel like you're in danger, um, it says here to call 911 immediately and then you would also call, call um, campus security. But some important facts are if you're in an open area, you're visible when you escape. If you're bringing an upset student down to us, bypass the wellness center. Just walk back to where you know the advisors and counselors are and bring the student to one of us. We have had students crying on the waiting line to check in at the wellness center. Oh. Just walk back. You know where we are. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Christine. So, Anna, again, in, for IT support for students, I'm going to refer you to a page that's in your folders under the helpful information for students section. It tells you how you can uh, get IT help while you're on campus during open school hours, and then how you can get IT help after hours um, as well from the CSC help, help desk. So you can take a look at that. And I think that's it. Are there any other questions? Great, great, thank you. other people in the advising department, but I'm talking about some of the general um, resources in advising. The advising department is located in A-Wing, um, and that's financial advising services, the Welcome Center. There's lots of information for students to go and, and pick up regarding their, their career paths, um, and there's always advisors there available to them to talk. The advisors there um, are are there Monday through Friday, um, eight, nine to five, nine to five. 
And then there are supplemental um, advisors from the faculty that fill in and that were assigned students. So they may refer like a nursing student back to us that we're um, advising. And if a student is with us and I have questions, I may refer to Jeff if it's criminology um, specific. So um, we all kind of help with the general populations. Career services, we heard from Celeste today and the virtual virtual um, career um, office with the virtual focus, College Central, and the optimal resume. And students really can access that from anywhere. Um, counseling, all advisors within the center provide um, counseling services. And if you have a student that's in your classroom or drops in your office. Last semester I had a student drop in my office that was upset and crying and actually was suicidal. It is best, and I know Krista said you can walk them down there, you need to walk them down there because if that student is that upset, they could walk out. So a lot of times they will walk with you to the, to the um, center and you can get them with a counselor that can help them or, or hook them up with counseling services in the community. The disability services and accommodation, um, Matt talked to that. And then our um, college has the food pantry. And the food pantry is available Mondays and Wednesdays from 10 to, um, 10 to 3. And on Tuesdays, 9 to 5. And on Thursdays, 9 to 3. Those hours change. So you can refer students there that may have some um, issues with obtaining food. Many of our students are on the edge with um, finances and, and the ability to gain access to food. And also, we do have a homeless population, and they can call the United Way um, info line 211 to get services on um, homelessness. And also, those students possibly may need some counseling, so bringing them or referring them and letting them know that we have that umbrella of help here. Um, to not only with their classes and their grades, but also with um, helping them to be successful through food and um, trying to find them shelter. I was just going to add one quick thing. So the advising, there's our faculty advisors and there's the advisors in counseling and advising. So all students are uh, assigned to a faculty advisor in the area of study plan of study that they put down on their application. Um, those of us who work in advising and counseling are typically um, advising non-degree students, as well as certain students who we do end up becoming their regular advisor for, um, for a variety of different reasons. Um, anything else about that? So students sometimes get a little confused because it's like, who is their advisor? Their advisor, their assigned advisor is their um, we are supplemental advisors, and you know, I guess I would call us that. And um, we are here to help you uh, as faculty with any kinds of questions or situations that you come up with. Um, and we are also there to um, take care of non-degree and various other groups of students that uh, don't have necessarily a program home, so to speak. Yeah, so we're, I think we have, oh, here, okay, we're getting there. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I just have a quick question. Yes. Um, how does the student find out who their advisor is? Okay, they um, they go on my comment, or they come into the Welcome Center. Do you all know where the Welcome Center is? The Welcome Center is the first, it's in the middle of the first floor A wing, and um, that is where most students start they come to figure out where to go in student services. Um, so to get to those of us in advising and counseling, um, I was just sharing this with the faculty member. You don't have to sign in at the welcome desk. <laughs> you just need to let them know that you're a faculty member if you're new, because they have student that people but they won't recognize you. And you're free to come on back. I'm only I'm telling you that desk screens. People. They do, because I've had faculty come in and be like, you know, it's happened three or four times, even going through financial aid. They're like, what's going on here? You know, I'm a faculty member. And it's like, we get it. So, and just want to add, we do send a letter, a hard copy letter to the students oh, home yeah, when they're first you. assigned their advisor, um, right the first week of class. 
Yes. And if they're changing advisors because they change degrees, they get a letter. And, and that does happen um, somewhat frequently. Okay. I'll just bring that up. I should have said something else. Those of you, um, if you have any folders, um, they're, they're organized. There's a whole table of contents right in the beginning, and um, all of the different things we're talking about are in there. And if we have time, we can run through it real quick, but I don't know if we will. But in any event, um, all that information is there for you. Um, and uh, hopefully, the table of contents can help you out. Okay. Uh, my name is Jeff Crouch. I'm a faculty member here, and I also help out on student services and advising and on the advising committee. And I'm here to give you a little tutorial on some really nuts and bolts stuff uh, as far as accessing student information. Uh, but I'll go through it relatively quickly. I put some brief detailed instructions over there, so if I lose any student travels at the end, I have to do it a couple times. It'll be fine. So you have that student come in, it's their first time they're coming to see you, you don't have a lot of experience advising here, what are you going to do? Well, log on to my ComNet, and then we're going to go here where it says student faculty self-serve, and you're going to get an error. <laughs> Banner Salt Service, so it was that. Okay. Yeah. And then try Banner Salt Service next to Help Me in the upper left hand corner. And then. Uh, homework to yeah. And that's what she's saying. I don't need homework, but then I'll say. And click on that. Then you're going to have a bunch of things you can pick from. And one of them will be your advising list. One would be to search by a student name, number, other types of things like that. Uh, so usually what I do before a student comes in, they've made an appointment with me. I know they're coming in. I go and pull their unofficial transcript and print that to put in their file before they come in. So I'm ready to go when they get in there. That's, that's one of those places where you would get their unofficial transcript. You would click on... Student ID, you have to put their ID number in first. If you don't have that, you can use their name, although it's a more difficult type of search. It's the, the ID number works better. Um, also, if they're assigned to you for advising, you can get their ID number by simply going to your advising list. So within that same area, again, it says, you know, advising list. Then if you just click the current semester, there's a little pop-up box. You just say fall 18, click on that, and then you're going to get your list. It's got all the students listed by ID number, name, major, I think if you're the primary advisor, it's got their email address on there. You can also, down at the very bottom of that page, click on spreadsheet, so that if you want to get in a spreadsheet form, print it off or something cool like that, you can do that. The student's name is going to be in blue. It's an active link. You can click on their name and then go right to get their transcript. You can get their uh, home address, phone number, if you want to send them a letter, call them, something like that, that's available too. And also from your advising list, that is where you would remove an advising hold. Now, sometimes students come in or they call or they email and say, oh, I've got a hold, can you take that off? The answer is no, you need to come see me. That's why we put those holds on there. So that for their first semester, 
there's a hold automatically put on them. They cannot register until they see an advisor. We want them to come in. We want to talk with them. We want to get to know them. We want them to get, find out where, who their advisor is, where that person is. So that's really the only way we have to get them in that first semester. After the first semester, there's no more hold. They can go register on their own if they want. But it's, kind of, it's not a good idea to come see me because then they take the wrong course or they do something else. And, you know, it creates grief for themselves. But come see us. Okay. So by that first time, they're going to come and see you. After you go through everything with them and you sign their reg form, you can just, it, there's a column there. It says advisory hold. Click on that. It'll say, are you sure you want to remove this hold? Click yes. And then they can go to the registrar's office, hand them the form, and they'll be able to register. If you don't do that, they're going to say, you have a hold on there. You need to go see your faculty advisor. If they're really nice, they might let them go back to the student services advisors who will advise them and then take their hold away. In addition to this advising hold, a student may say, well, I've got, I tried registering online. This is maybe not a first semester student. And it won't let me register. It says I have a hold. And then you go check and you find out, well, they don't have an advisor hold. It's some other kind of hold. We don't handle those some other kind of holds. It could be a variety of things. It could be a financial issue. It could be a number of things. They're going to have to go down to the Welcome Center, get checked in. If they can check and see exactly what that hold is, we can't find that out. We don't have access to that. We just have access to advisor holds. They're going to have to go down there talk to one of the student services advisors, they'll find out what kind of hold it is and then direct them to wherever they need to go. If it's a financial aid issue or it's maybe the probation or something along those lines or certain things have to happen, they're only limited to certain courses or only certain people can sign them to take, register. So there's a variety of things that they could be going on there. So let's see, that's the basic hold. We talked about advising the list and the unofficial transcript, again, you can get it two ways. One is through your uh, advising list, or if you just want to put the student's name in there, you can get that. Like I said, I always print mine off, update their plan of study before they come in so they're kind of ready to go. Um, where's Sarah? I'm, Sarah, I'm going to steal your, your tagline. If you have any advising questions as a faculty member, please see me. Part of my role is a, I'm a faculty, what do they call me, faculty Inter advising Inter mentor. Inter so, you know, part of what I do is to work with other faculty, particularly new people, kind of get them up to speed to advising. I'm happy to do that. Usually it's I make a couple appointments with the person. We spend a couple hours going over things. Uh, but even after that, if you have something that comes up, because it's kind of a curve when it comes to advising of figuring stuff out. And once you get over a certain point, you've probably heard 80% of the questions, and it isn't that so bad after that. But that big first part is steep. Okay. And I know you're all here, you work at a community college, you're interested in students, you want to do the best we can for students, which means giving them good advice, making sure they take the right courses, lead them in the right direction for employment, all those other kinds of things. And that advising visit is is the chance to do that, is to make a connection with the students. One other thing I'm just going to throw in there is a pitch. If you're at all interested in students and advising, please come to the committee meeting. We, meet, we usually meet the last Monday of the month. Well, this this one's last, I think. This one's where we meet next Monday. Everybody is welcome. We, it's a unique committee in many ways that is both faculty and staff. And uh, you know, we have kind of levels of advisor. We expect faculty are expecting kind of a basic level of advisor so that a student shows up, we can help them with their schedule, and they can go on their way. But we have other levels, so if you want to get more interested in it and learn more, and maybe come in out and help out with student services during the peak time, uh, you can do that. If you have an option for AR, you can do that. I'm not sure how, how we're going to handle it with people who don't have that option right now. Uh, they really need the help down there. They really appreciate the help down there. Christine just sent out an email that in the month of August, student services registered almost 2,000 students. Right, it's crazy down there. Uh, those of us on the committee, most of us go down there. We work either 20 or 40 hours during the month of August to help out, and it's just busy. But you really get to know the, yes, you really get to know the students. You're going to come across things that can really help you learn about how advising, how things work, and you know it really can be very 
in addition to being helpful to them, it can be a very satisfying experience. So I just want to throw that pitch in. Any questions? And like I said, I've got the tail instructions. I don't think this was working as a walkthrough, but it's right over there. You can grab them and I'm sure it'll be fine. If you're not sure, just click on stuff. Eventually, you'll figure out you're not going to break it. Okay. <laughs> My name is Andrew Marvin. I am in the English Communication Department here at Three Rivers, and like just, just, just described, I'm one of those faculty who tries to do uh, extra advising to try to get my head wrapped around it a little bit better. Uh, I know what you're all thinking from this morning is that, well, what Jeff just attempted valiantly to demonstrate are the hard skills of how to use the website. And so I think what I have been tasked with is more of the soft skills of advice uh, and a little bit more of the, the touch, not touching really, but a little bit more of the um, person to person type stuff. Um, so I have uh, two documents here that are going to be available over there on the paper table. Um, the first document is just a couple of email templates for how to reach out to your advisees. Uh, Jeff mentioned that you can access your entire advisee list in Banner when it's working, which is most days to be fair. Um, and at the bottom of that advisee list there is a link. If you're a full-time faculty member on campus and you have a desktop computer, uh, there is a link at the bottom that you can click on and it will populate all of your advisees in the blind private copy field so that way you can email everybody really easily. So I'm going to show you a couple of uh, email templates, one that I send out at the beginning of the semester and one that I send out a little bit later uh, when it's closer to new registration time for the following semester. And then most of what I'm going to say about working with students just one-on-one -on -one is on this little tip sheet that I made, which again is over there. Um, so, this is the uh, email template that I use. Different faculty advisors, um, we all have a template that's a little bit different. You are free to uh, adapt it, right, as long as it kind of contains just the basic gist of things. What I've done here on this template for you guys is bracket the information that you would need to swap out with your own info. Um, so this is the one that I send out like in the first week of classes just to say hello, to let them know that I exist and I am a person who acknowledges them, um, which is great. So I'm your faculty advisor, what does that even mean? Here to help you pick up classes, talk about stuff as needed, uh, answer any questions that you may have, uh, give my office number and my office hours for the semester. I do mention that uh, good advising usually takes time, so I do try to keep with my advisors anyway, try to keep them to um, scheduled appointments because you don't really want a student to just like drop by and you know five minutes before your class and then you're like super rushed and they feel like they inconvenienced you. So um, doing it by appointment is a great way to do it. I know some faculty like to rely on the sign sheet on the door, I usually just communicate with uh, with email by making appointments and that sort of thing. Um, my email address is there, uh, and then I give them a little bit heads up, a little bit of a heads up that uh, registration doesn't start until whatever date, right? In the case of this semester, doesn't start until November first, so I tell them be on the lookout for another email from me in mid October uh, to remind you to make an appointment with me to pick out classes, check in, get those advisor bills released, uh, and that sort of stuff. So this is what I sent out uh, in the first week of the semester or so, just to kind of introduce myself and let them know that I'm here. And then in the uh, middle of the semester, it's about two weeks or, or more before um, registration starts, before registration actually opens, I send out a longer email that contains much more uh, detailed information. There is kind of a lot of stuff here, but you can um, you know, have good taste in your email formatting and kind of make it readable uh, and not too overwhelming. So this time I'm telling them that, hey, heads up, it's, uh, it's, time, it's go time, right? The winter and spring, in this case, course schedules are now available. There's a link to that brings you up to that search page where you can see what courses are being offered. Uh, and I try to add a little bit of color just to highlight important pieces of information. Uh, registration for continuing students, which is the people that are going to be reading this email, begins on Thursday, November 1st. I try to emphasize that they do have this great two-week window where registration is only open to them. Uh, that way they really have their pick of the days and the times that they're most interested in. 
usually two weeks after uh, continuing registration starts. Um, I don't know what you call it, open registration, general registration, right? New registration, anybody can, can register for classes at Three Rivers. So at that time, classes do tend to uh, fill slowly, but steadily. Um, yeah, and then in the next paragraph, right? Ideally, they want to come in, meet with me, pick out classes, have all that information ready to go, whether it's a, a hard registration form or you know, have all the CRNs picked out or whatever, so that when registration opens, they feel confident knowing that they're going to get the days, times, sections that they need. Um, and that would be that's the best way to get to the schedule that uh, they will find the least painful in terms of days and time. What else? Uh, reiterating my role as an advisor, reiterating my office hours. Uh, I do mention the stuff about the advising poll that Jeff kind of went through. And then down here at the bottom, there's just a little bulleted list about other hypothetical situations where you might want to meet with your advisor. And as you can see, these are pretty uh, general and all-encompassing, right? So hopefully they'll see that, well, I definitely fall into at least one of those categories, so maybe I should go see this guy. Um, make an appointment by client email, and I also do a little plug for advising days. Uh, which we hold every semester, and advising days are usually held in the multi-purpose room. It's an all-day affair with uh, all hands on deck in terms of financial aid is down there, the cashier is down there, the registrar is down there, faculty advisors are there, program coordinators are there. So it's a great one-stop shop uh, advising opportunity for students um, if they're having difficulty getting in touch with their faculty advisor or otherwise uh, having trouble, they can just go there right, without an appointment and get most things taken care of at once. Um, does anybody have any questions? The only other thing I'll say about this is obviously, um, you know, don't don't feel beholden to mine. I can forward you a digital copy if you're interested. But uh, I do try to. And this will lead me to the next thing. Uh, I do try to, uh, you know, have a little bit of voice right in my written communications. Right. So this hopefully sounds a little bit like me, but it makes them feel a little bit less intimidated about meeting with their faculty advisor. Um, so don't feel like your emails to your advisees need to sound robotic. You know, try to have a little bit of humanity in your writing. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions about the emails? Again, these templates are over there for anybody who wants them. And then, there it goes. And then, uh, this is just a tip sheet that I threw together just because I wanted to over prepare. Um, and uh, this is just, this is not a definitive list, it's just the sorts of things that I tend to think about when I'm dealing with students, when I'm meeting with students. Um, it's crooked, but I'm going to resist this. Uh, so, uh, a couple of tips that some people have already mentioned, right, you can keep an email list, but it's really easy to email everybody with a banner like Jeff showed us. Uh, introduce yourself at the beginning of the semester, announce when it's time to meet, plan for next semester. And I think it's really important to, to communicate and uphold your office hours, your availability, whatever your contact preferences are. Just make that known and then stick to that sort of thing. Uh, like Jeff mentioned, I like to prepare for their arrival. Um, show up and be on time for uh, be on time for advising appointments sounds like an advice for students, but it's actually an advice for us as well uh, to make sure that you are actually there when you say you're going to be there. Um, I'm a big believer in systems, at least when it comes to personal productivity. So uh, do find an organizational system that works for you. Uh, I still use one hard copy folder for each student, like Jeff told me years ago. Some people can do it digitally; that's great too. But whatever your system is, stick to it and come up with a system that you can trust. Like Jeff said, try to know the general purpose of the meeting ahead of time. That way you can kind of, you know, have a rough estimate of how long it's going to take. Uh, and I like to print out and review any relevant materials ahead of time also, just so I kind of have my uh, brain in the right place. And the last thing I'll say, rock the meeting, exactly. <laughs> so this is, this is like what I said, um, what our presenters this morning talked about, kind of with the soft seal in terms of, you know, what, what do you, you've got this, you've got this student in front of you, and like what to do with this person. Um, so the first thing that I try to do is just be excited to see them. You know, they showed up, we're excited when the students show up to our class, so you should be excited, even in a one-on-one -on -one context when they, uh, they take the time to, to come see you and ask you for your help. Uh, I try to present an organized, knowledgeable, and friendly persona, so in the same way that this version of myself that you all are seeing is a little bit different than the version of myself when I go back to my office. Uh, you need to be prepared to put on the advising mask or the advising hats, like, you know, instantly. Right? So no matter what's going on in your personal life, no matter how many papers you would really, really wish you were grading instead of having to deal with this advisee, you got to leave all that outside of your office just like you leave it outside the classroom and be, uh, be ready to go. Um, like Meg said, we have a really uh, you know, student population that's very diverse and they've got a lot of different levels, uh, a lot of different skill levels right, in various things of dealing with life and academia and that sort of thing. Uh, so I try to demonstrate good habits, like I write things down, I try to identify questions that I don't know the answers to, uh, and try to think about, like, okay, who can, where can I get the answers to this question? 
and just kind of being a good role model, obviously not infantilizing them, right? Because they are grown-ups. But at the same time, uh, you want to kind of be, be a good role model. Uh, be genuine. High structure. High structure, exactly. Thank you, Mike. Uh, be genuine. Admit what you don't know. Don't make stuff up. Right? Ask for help. Um, Jeff kind of mentioned this already, but I will tell you that there is no more patient group of people than the A-Wing staff. Like, put all of them on speed dial and just, you know, I hate picking up the phone as much as the next guy. But, um, you know, get in the habit of, of asking them for help. You will never be disappointed with the, um, the help that you receive from them. Try to put the students at ease, right? Be calm, be patient, be helpful. Move at their pace. Don't overwhelm them. Throw a lot of stuff uh, at them at once. Try to keep a comfortable environment. So I always think, like, when a student walks into my office, what do they get? Are they getting Chinese food all over the place? Are they getting, like, all, are all my lights off? You know, and it's very creepy in there. You know, is it clean? Is it organized? Uh, so just kind of think about things from their perspective. You know, or is, it, is it difficult to work across the desk from somebody? Is there a place where we can sit more side by side? Uh, acknowledge their humanity. Use their name. Right, That's a great way to acknowledge that they're a person. Um, talk about more than just classes. Obviously, this is a huge thing, but there's more to advising than just, you know, what classes do you need? Okay, check the ticket. Learn about who they are, right, as people. Um, I like to ask lots of questions. How are you? What's going on? How did that go? How did you feel about that? What do you think? Why do you think that is? And then what else, which I use a lot uh, with my students. What else do I need to know about? What else is going on? What else are you worried about? What else are you unsure of? What else, you know, is going on? Whatever that is. Try to be present. Respect their time and attention. Uh, try not to be thinking about how you have a class in 45 minutes that you have prepared for. Um, so try to, you know, when you try to not be multitasking, obviously don't be texting while you're trying to talk to them. Uh, listen, which is one of my things I don't know. One thing I like to do at the end of meetings is clarify next next actions for both of you, right? So here's what I'm going to do as your advisor. I'm going to figure out the answers to these questions. Uh, and what are you going to do, right? You're going to do these things, right? Because they, they're uh, responsible for things as well. So all this is in service of making them want to come back, right? And, you know, trying to give them, at least for me, I'm trying to give them an impression like, okay, this guy is normal, and he seems to kind of know what he's doing. So hopefully that, you know, encourages them to come back in the future. Um, I will say don't assume, again, we're not infantilizing right, our students, but at the same time, you don't want to assume that they know how to use a calendar, that they know how to write things down that they need to do, that they know how to use the website, that they know how to find course descriptions, any of these things. Um, teach, don't lecture, and the story on that. Uh, listening, obviously, is very important. You know what listening means. And all of this really is in service of demonstrating that we care for our students uh, in, a, uh, you know, in the best way. Uh, the best part of advising for me is not reading course descriptions and checking off boxes on plans for studies, but it's the conversations and you know getting to know people and building trusting relationships with your, with your students and advisors. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? If you have any questions, I'll be happy to talk to you after the show. Otherwise, both of the documents that I threw up there uh, are over there on the takeaways table. I know. Oh, good. I just want to mention that everything that Angie said is what we do to attend to. That relationship with your students and pairing that to what the curriculum says to teach them. Uh, I was tasked with talking about academic standing and progress of learning and midterm grades. So this is in your folders for the new five. We have a sheet um, and I believe you cut you to both. Academic standing is calculated at the end of every semester. These categories and rules are from the board of these are not things that we made up. So I've had many conversations with faculty, and they might not be pleased. None of us are fault of it. Anyway, 11 or fewer credits, less than a 1.5, puts you on academic morning. The 11 or few, fewer credits does not include developmental courses, which means that a student could have two pick credit developmental courses, have Ds, uh, three credits of, of a college level course and have a D, and they're just on morning. So some people feel that that gives them a false sense of security, a false sense of how they're doing. 12 to 30 credits, less than 1.7, is academic probation. Once you're on academic probation, you have a limit of nine credits. That's all you're allowed to take. Now, if you have a student coming and talking to you about this, and there's an extenuating circumstance, or that was when they were working 40 hours a week, and now this, this semester they quit their job, and they want to do 12 credits, that can be waived. You can waive them up to 12 credits if it was reasonable, not just because they want to take more, but for some mitigating circumstance that you have figured. Um, the last category is 31 or more credits, and that would be less than 2.0. That is also academic probation. 
if you're on academic probation for one semester and you don't gain good standing, you're automatically put on suspension. Um, academic suspension means you won't be, you're not allowed to attend school for one semester. Again, that can be waived as well. That can only be waived by the student service advisors. Uh, these are charged to record and see how successful the students are. If they are waived, then we go on from there. Sometimes it takes a long time to get out of academic suspension. Yes? Uh, you will find this on the student's transcript. So at the very last entry for the current semester or the last semester they were here, it'll say standing, it'll list the good warning probation of probation. So that's how you know. At the end of term process when it's yep. done. So combined academic standing is composed of academic standing that I just quickly ran through and progress evaluation. Progress evaluation um, is how the percentage of courses you need to finish. But just to make things confusing, developmental courses are not counted academic standing, but they are counted in progress evaluation. And you need to keep a 50% um, completion rate. That, that's what they want to be the standard. Question. Oh, the last paragraph is about financial aid. If you're not confused enough, financial aid has a whole different set of standards. Their standards are set by the federal government. So if you see a satisfactory academic progress hold on the student's account, a SAP hold, or the student talks about needing to get a financial aid waiver, again, you can send them down to student services to go consult with financial aid and to see exactly what it is. Um, this week I sent out an email about progress alert. Progress alert is a way that you could alert your student and alert student services when a student might be having academic difficulties or attendance difficulties. Um, in the email there was a link, so I'm not going to go into all what, exactly how you do it, but you'll send an email to the student. The same email comes to us, and then we will contact the student and try to offer them other services that they may need as well. Um, if you email your students independently and you're following up with them and that works out, that's fine. We're there to help. But if you want our assistance, use the progress alert and we will, we will get in touch with the student as well. In terms of giving good feedback to a student, our students do not self-assess very well, especially in the first semester. The first time I sent out early alert, Betty will remember this, we were shocked. The window was so crowded, the people who said, this must be a mistake. I'm doing great. This must be a mistake. There was no mistake. They just don't self-assess correctly. We have to tell them, you're having trouble. You're not attending enough. Um, so we do require midterm grades now. We usually do it from the sixth to eighth week, but we can extend that. Um, if some faculty have grades early part of the semester, so they might be ready to get a grade. Some have it a little bit later and they're not ready. So we'll, we're very flexible with that midterm grade, but we do like them to get midterm grades. There's two ways. You can do it through Blackboard, or you can do it through Banner, the same way you would afford, you would afford your final grades. Blackboard is preferred because if you use the Blackboard grading system, then your student always has an idea of how they are, how much each assignment is worth, so we do prefer that. The disadvantage to that is it's hard for us to see. You have to ask the student to pull up your grades. Um, the other way is through Banner, and that is through what Jeff was trying to show you, through the Banner self, faculty self-service. One of the drop-downs is grades, and you can either click final grades or midterm grades. Any questions? <laughs> so when you write in the progress alert email, knowing that it's going to be read by the student and by somebody in student service, how much detail do you need? Like, do I need to say, you've missed homework assignment number two, and you've got a B plus on paper number one, but you haven't been here for three days. You know, how much How much do you then need to know? Um, there's a big variance um, in what, how much is written in those emails. Um, you could really could be gentle, because once we start talking to the student, you're going to ask them, how, how many classes have you made? You know, how busy is your schedule? So if you want to be general, that's fine. If you want to be specific, that's fine. It's only going to be read by an advisor calling them. I know faculty said it starts at 2 o'clock, so I guess we have to go. Are we good? Are we good? Am I doing FERPA? Okay. Oh, okay. Um, FERPA is a federal law that guarantees the privacy of student records. Um, once a student enters higher ed, then the uh, 
the power of their privacy is from the parents to the student, even if they're under 18, even if the student, even if the parent is paying for their tuition. So at that point, you cannot talk to the parents, you cannot access them. Uh, you can give them general ideas, like, well, if the student has a 1.7, they might be having a really difficult and they might harm her patient, but we can't talk about the individual student or the parent. The one exception is if they fill out a care order in the state. So if the student in front of the registrar's office or us fills out that PERC form, they can give us permission to release information to the parents. Even in that situation, we have the right not to do that. And then we have the right about how much information we get. We had a big discussion in our council meeting the other day about DARPA, and when the parent is sitting next to the student in that particular meeting, they say, sign the form, sign the form. Um, we want to look at the student's own interest. So they can rescind the form. For releases are due only for one semester. They have to do them again the next semester, so they have, uh, and they can rescind them at any time. If you have trouble with the parent over that, you can call us and we'll get back to you on the phone. Thank you, everybody. It's great seeing you all. I'm glad you're all particularly invited. And like Jeff said, join us, <laughs> please. <laughs>